Well, thank you everyone for being here this morning. Really appreciate it. I think you're in for a special treat today as we really dissect and dive into big data in a way like I think you've never heard before. And so we're anxious to, uh, to do it with an esteemed group of panelists, some of whom I've had the pleasure of backing as a venture capital investor and others, others uh, consulting with. So really look forward to diving in. I'm Bill Geary, uh, been in the healthcare technology venture capital business for about 20 years uh, and have invested uh, over that time, uh, our firm in 200 companies from early stage and startup through to growth equity investments. And about 20% of those have been in healthcare technology innovation, which is where I've spent, I've spent my whole investing career. Uh, and so I think that gives me uh, perhaps a unique perspective on the question of, of big data uh, as we've made a handful of investments in and around this space and really think of it as one of the fundamental drivers. And so maybe to frame some of our questions this morning, um, you know, for me, there are three categories and, and maybe, you know, three, three foundational tenets of what's going to drive healthcare technology innovation. And I think of uh, consumerization as one of those, mobility and analytics. And a lot has been you know, written about analytics, a lot's been talked about, but we're gonna try and be a little provocative uh, uh, today and also uh, want to ask the audience for a lot of participation. So expect that the second half uh, of our panel will be turning it over to you uh, for questions. And so I want you to think about questions, tee them up, and, and we'll get to you and look forward to this being very interactive. But meanwhile, let me introduce our panelists. So Jean Druin, He's uh, a partner at McKinsey, runs their global healthcare practice, has been at McKinsey for about 14 years, uh, and, um, and, and is an MD. So he's been in the medical field uh, for some time, in addition to probably being the premier, the premier uh, consultant in the healthcare uh, space during his tenure at McKinsey. So we're pleased to have him. Uh, Chris Kreider. Chris uh, is a serial entrepreneur. He currently chairs uh, the board of an investment of mine, a company called Valence Health, which I'm sure he'll talk about. He started a company called D2 Hawkeye, which merged with and became Veris Health. Uh, and he too uh, is, an, is an MD, so he's gonna have an interesting perspective uh, on things. Steve McHale is CEO and co-founder of a company called Explorus, which is kind of right in the middle, right in the torrent of this healthcare big data. This was a company that had its roots at Cleveland Clinic. And then Mike Weintraub is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Humedica. Uh, which was recently acquired by United Optum. And before that, Mike was the CEO uh, at a company in a similar space uh, called Farmetrics. So, uh, so that's our panel. Thank you, we're pleased, pleased to have you. Uh, but let's just jump right in with a couple of questions to get things going. Uh, so maybe let's get very granular first. So give me an example of, of where healthcare big data has really delivered on a promise, has really changed something. John, I'm gonna start with you. But a, a clear, crisp example, everyone talks about actionable insight and all the great promise, but a real example with ROI when it comes to healthcare big data. Yeah, uh, it, it's actually a very good question. Um, the one everybody talks about is population health management and um, risk stratification. Uh, to be fair on that one, uh, the jury is out because uh, while it's possible to risk stratify folks, to then uh, narrow it to the necessary population to uh, match the right uh, interventions has proven tough for folks. But I'm gonna give you one where I think uh, we're just on the cusp of having this have a large ROI, and uh, this is around patient access and waits for uh, outpatient appointments. If we treated outpatient appointments like airlines treat seats uh, and did yield management in the same way that they do our hotels, uh, we could release 20 or 30 percent capacity uh, and uh, essentially most healthcare systems in the country could uh, have next day appointment guarantees like the Cleveland Clinic. So for me, that would be a big one. Mm. Mike, how about you? I think there are examples across the population. There are organizations out there in healthcare that are for the first time with big data, seeing something called the manufacturing process of healthcare, you know, how the patient moves across the continuum. We see organizations that are using predictive um, analytics and predictive modeling off of the complete big data set of their patients that have chronic and ongoing heart issues. And we are seeing <clears throat> seven figure reductions in costs by keeping people out of the emergency room 
um, creating a continuum of care where they are intervening with those patients through patient communication, pushing information using mobility to those individuals, pushing information to the physicians to ensure there's follow-up on those patients, ensure there's compliance with their meds, and we are seeing uh, organizations publishing 75% reductions in readmissions to the hospital for their patients who suffer from a variety of heart ailments based on big data, which turns into seven-figure savings. They're then taking that information, and they are negotiating new ways of uh, contracting with payers, where they are sharing the risk and sharing the value, i.e. the savings, because they are committing to those payers that they will spend less money and they will take the risk if it costs them more and they want to share the upside if they save money. We can paint, point to examples like that with diabetes where more than half the individuals who have diabetes are not followed on. They're not coming back to see their doctors. Their typical engagement with the healthcare system is in the ER as opposed to in the doctor's office. They're not taking their meds and we see examples of uh, individuals who are being brought into care because the organizations did not see the data to understand and bifurcate the population and understand who's engaging with their system and who's not. And we're seeing seven-figure savings, and we're seeing significant reductions in comorbidities, complications, and a variety of ailments which are triggered by diabetes. Uh, Steve, everyone talks about, about patient engagement and changing patient behavior. <clears throat> what about physician behavior change, and how important is that relative to the, the success of, of, of these kinds of actionable insights that Explorers generates? Yeah, I think that we've noticed that the greatest challenge is change management, right? Behavior change, workflow change, how do we engage with a patient? Um, as you asked about evidence, you know, what we've seen is uh, even in diabetics when we've gotten that change in place in the workflow, we've seen uh, one system take their hemoglobin A1C, for example, into control from a 34% rate to 51, or readmissions drop by 35%. Specific, measurable, and demonstrable results from, uh, as Michael just shared, engaging the, the teams uh, to um, basically, with prescriptive analytics, understand what kinds of interventions need to happen at what points of care. So we've seen you know, tremendous results when the team is engaged and when they understand that they need to treat these populations and people differently and proactively. So it works, but the hardest part is to get these, um, these folks to, to learn how to deliver medicine differently versus in a completely reactive mode. How do they start to engage proactively, um, reduce those comorbidities, for example, of diabetes that you heard earlier, is, is critical to, uh, to driving the cost down and, and, frankly, the quality of care. And so, so how much time does your organization spend in an implementation with changing physician behavior? Well, that's, that's probably that's the majority of our time, to be honest with you. The, um, it wasn't our plan, you know, as we started, it, as I would share. I didn't come from health care. Um, you know, my background has been in large-scale banking and telecom. And uh, the concept was, you know, we, we had a lot of understanding of how to manage very large scale data in industries that have matured and consolidated. As you see the consolidation around healthcare, the change, the change management issues here are significant, the ones that we hadn't really anticipated. Um, and so uh, it's changed the way that we've had to approach the effort and the resources to apply um, into, this, mm -hmm. into this environment. So, 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 Chris, are analytics for healthy people different for, for the impact of these kind of analytics for sick people? Uh, I don't think analytics, uh, I don't think big data has generated a big ROI for either uh, yet. Uh, it's, it's just way too early. I, I'm thinking about Mike's point, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that there haven't been improvements, but when you when you look at savings in the context of a fee-for-service system, it, it starts to confuse your mind if you're the CFO of, of an institution that depends on volume. So when you overlay the, the wonderful and dramatic change to risk, um, and that's really just beginning. I mean, I mean physician behavior <clears throat> isn't really going to change, I think, uh, if we give each other truth serum you know, it, and, and, and really ask for the answer, it isn't going to change until the incentives really change. And we're at the very early stages of um, in moving from pay for performance to risk. And when that, 
when that moves, I think the ROI will be dramatic. If we move from big data to big analytics to small but really valuable analytics, um, it's a, right now it's, there's information overload mm -hmm. and it's very hard to generate the, the valuable nuggets. It hasn't, Jean, hasn't Jean, happened yet. Why don't you take, take the natural follow-up question to that too, and what lessons can we learn from other industries as it applies to healthcare in, the, in this regard in terms of, in terms of analytics? So a, a colleague uh, who um, has done a lot of this sort of work in banking was uh, saying to me yesterday, actually, that when they looked at how to apply technology and data to fundamentally uh, improve their business processes, they, they looked at customer journeys. And in a bank, there are 600 of them. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to have to do in healthcare is get that granular. There's a difference between being admitted for a specific procedure, uh, you know, for surgery, which is different than coming in through the emergency room for something else, which is different than coming in as an outpatient for, uh, or, you know, post uh, procedure, um, you know, everything that you do to prevent readmission. And I think it comes to your point, which is uh, unless we make things small enough that they're actually grounded in reality, it's going to be very difficult to get the uh, ROI out. Uh, Mike? Yeah, just a comment to tie everything together. So I agree with uh, the comments of my chief competitor. We have finally met after all these years uh, on change management. You know, there's a saying that culture eats strategy for lunch every day. Um, so it doesn't matter what your strategy is, but if the incentives are not there, the economics are not there, the culture manifests itself in certain ways. The, I also agree that today <clears throat> the investments in big data, macro investments in this country in healthcare, far exceed the savings, far exceed the savings. The reality is, is that big data is currently compartmentalized. It means different things to different people but it's going to evolve very, very quickly. And those organizations, hopefully those sitting at this table, that evolve at, the, at rapid lightning speed will win. It used to be that big data just meant you had lots of volume, disparate data, lots of variety, and lots of velocity. It was just coming quickly. That's great. So it sits in the corner. Someone's doing some scientific analysis on it. And it's not integrated into the workflow. And by the time you have an insight, who cares? So then the game has changed, and now let's put it all together. <clears throat> you can't just look at the inpatient data because people go to the clinic. You have to look at the prescription drug data. 150 million Americans have chronic diseases. They're on medication. So let's get all that data together across the continuum. That wasn't the case four years ago. Now that exists. Then the game has changed again, just to continue down. Are the analytics in the system, or do you need some scientists on the side doing analysis that takes three to six months, or are they powered into the system? That's now happening, and we've kept pace with each other. Once that happens, is it in the workflow? They will not use the darn thing unless it's pushed to the point of care, to the physician, to the patient, influencing easy actionability. So knowledge has to meet action, or else it won't be used. And then the incentives have to change. So I'm sure there's comments from my colleague, but we are in the second inning, which is an appropriate term for Boston Nation right now. Um, it's one nothing. We are in the beginning of a very long journey, but the iterative process of innovation with big data is going to occur in three-month periods for the next three to five years. It's not going to be slow. All those pieces, and once all that happens, and that information is pushed to those that consume the data, the physician, the patient, et cetera, you will start seeing the investments eclipsed by the savings. But it's going to take several years and a, a bunch of failure. Mm. Yeah, I think there's, if I could offer a comment, that's, um, is we're all taking our truth serum, that you know, big data in healthcare isn't really here yet. I mean, the, the, the data we need uh, that will really constitute that, which is, uh, as Michael just shared, high, high velocity, high variety, you know, real-time streaming data is going to come from the, more of the perimeters. Um, the structured data that we see today inside of the existing health system um, 
uh, models is, is uh, you know, structured data, it's available, it's, you know, there's, of course, there's notes in there, we can do, we do NLP on, those kinds of things, but when you think about it, um, there's so much more data that's going to be coming in that will inform where we are with our patients and, and their ability to take accountability for themselves uh, as we move forward as a consumer. And, you know, as we think about it as a big data company, we're a really a big data processing company, and so there's a difference there in that, you know, an example we'd have is like, you know, across 200,000 providers, we'd run 600 measures or 120 million measures in 90 minutes. We'd calculate that data. So we've put the, you know, our strategy is put the infrastructure in place for very, very, very high performance analytics and processing so that you can start to transform the little data we have with big data technology in anticipation of that really granular data, full continuum of care data starting to stream in because there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to get in place to get our arms around that data. So I think you know, that's, that's, that's our perspective on, on what's happening in the market. And again, analytics, prescriptive analytics at the right place at the right time is really going to bend the, bend the curve. Chris, did you have an observation? A okay. <clears throat> couple of quick points. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One, I, I think there's an exception. <clears throat> with regard to ROI, and that is with extremely sick um, and very narrow orphan diseases. If we look at genomics and how it, uh, genetic testing has evolved over the last five years, there are uh, places where there <clears throat> is wonderful ROI for individuals, um, but no really su substantial ROI for systems. Uh, so that really is an exception. That has taken, you know, uh, zipabytes of, of data and, yeah. and mm -hmm. boiled it down into you know a, a single mutation and and you can inject a protein mm -hmm. for some rare diseases and it doesn't do anything for the 65 percent of the money we spend on chronic disease. I mean, diabetes is too complicated um, to be able to to get down to a, a, a SNP that can can change uh, change a life uh, and it. It reminds me that there is another complexity. We can, we can go from all the data to real information to real knowledge, uh, but when, when patients get sick, and I'm talking about chronic patients who have a, acute problems or uh, healthy people that get acutely ill, all of that stuff resides in the past medical history. You know, when when doctors see patients, it, it's all about starting with the chief complaint and the history of the present illness. And all of the information that it exists to help support that doesn't change the need to get down to uh, the individual situation. Um, and, and trying to make science out of art is, is always going to be uh, is, is always going to be a challenge. Uh, so that's, a, that's another a caveat about um, how hard it is to, to generate value. So let's talk about the retailization of healthcare uh, for a second. And how does that relate to, to what, what you're doing, uh, Mike and Steve and, and John, what you're, what you're seeing? And so are doctors, will doctors be relegated or maybe, maybe promoted? Uh, to expert roles that are very different than, than, than where physicians are today, and, and how will the importance of the efforts in the retail space, uh, how, will, how important will those be to, to kind of analytics and insight when care is so fundamentally, you know, it, not just flu shots, but increasing seriousness of care is being delivered in retail settings? I mean, our, our belief is that key objective is to get all clinicians to operate at the top of their license. That's, you know, and can you raise the bar there as well? So that's, you know, things that don't need to be done by the physicians uh, or, and affiliated clinicians uh, need to be uh, moved into other care models. So we think the retail setting's got great potential. Uh, you, you've heard about, you know, even um, ACOs forming with health systems in the retail systems right now um, that are out there, that are public. So we, you know, we think there's great potential there. Yeah, I, I think on retail, 
a, a couple of things, and I'll pick up on something you mentioned earlier, which is mobility. Uh, is um, what, we're, what we're trying to do is to fundamentally change individual patient journeys. And uh, in terms of the role of the physician, there's two things that we see happening. Is one, to the top of the license comment, is um, for given patient journeys, what you want to do is to say, um, you know, who, who's the expert that you need to involve? Uh, and ideally, if a nurse practitioner can do it, and you know, not a you know more expensive uh, trained person, then that that's what you'd want. Uh, and so, what you're seeing happening then is, and you see it by the way, in terms of the strategies that some of the uh, partners, New York Presbyterians of the world, are going to, which is. They're saying, look, there's going to be 10 or 15 of us in the country who can still be at the very high end and um, essentially service the um, quaternary needs. Uh, and then uh, Long Island Jewish is a great example of what's going on uh, in the mid-range, where they're essentially saying, look, we're going to be the Kaiser Permanente of the East Coast, and in seven years' time, we're going to be a $20 billion integrated health system. If you then go one layer down and you say, okay, well, what does that mean for doctors? There's essentially two needs. There's going to be some who are at the top of the totem pole, if you will, and serving in those 10 to 15 systems and really expert, and um, they're going to have a national footprint, or certainly regional. Uh, and then there's going to increasingly a need, and this came from, um, you know, the chief executive MD Anderson, for team captains, because for chronic disease, that's what we're missing right now is, is how to integrate things. And the lesson I take from, say, an Amazon in this is they know before you do that you have a problem. Uh, and so if we want to put the big data into this is can some of the analytics that we bring to this play some of that integrating, integrative team captain type of role? Uh, and yeah, if you hear Kaiser speak about what they're trying to do now that they're five years into their investment in Epic, that's what they're trying to create. And I think to your point, the reality is they're on the cusp of generating value from that. Uh, it hasn't been the source of their value up until now. It's still mostly because they're big, they're able to generate volume discounts and, um, you, you know, the like. So let's talk about the role of the EMR, though. Um, certainly foundational technology, critical to enable most of what we're talking about. But will EMRs ultimately win in this space? Are they a friend? Are they a foe? And, 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 and then I'm going to get to insurance companies next, Mike, so, so, so be ready. But EMRs, friend or foe? Um, I have to look around first, see who's in the audience. Because <laughs> I know the president of Epic is here. So, um, you know, I, I think they're not going anywhere. Um, I've been in uh, business intelligence, which used to be called decision support, before there was voicemail. Um, and um, there has always been room for business intelligence, science, and analytics capabilities to the left and right of transaction systems. And I'll be direct and say that the systems that are the plumbing that keeps all that data going, the transaction systems, always object to folks like us, always. But I've been involved in six companies, all six are still around, and all six worked with the EMR, worked with the general ledger system, worked with the payroll system, because it's a different DNA. And so today, we are grabbing information from dozens of different EMRs and internal legacy systems. Um, you know, I saw Dr. Blumenthal a year or two ago, uh, who you all know, David Blumenthal, and he said it's folks like you and explorers that are solving for interoperability. And so, there are initiatives underway where they are trying to collaborate, but the reality is, is that if you want to create a data store, back to your retail comment, a common data store that is normalized ontologically from a terminology perspective, because doctors aren't going to write this stuff down differently because folks like me tell them to or ask nicely. They just won't. So you have to take what you have, including all the unstructured data, you have to do something with it you have to recognize that a typical large integrated delivery network or healthcare system isn't only going to have Epic or Cerner, and they've bought a practice that has all scripts, and they've bought a practice that has NextGen, and they've bought a six hospital system that has Meditech, and it's not all gonna become one system. 
And so there is a role to homogenize all that data, normalize it, create a common data store that can do what you need it to do. We are grabbing all that information. We are um, providing it back as desired back into host systems. Um, and so I think right now there's still a little bit of a fight or a significant fight in that the typical systems, and unfortunately I'm old enough to have seen the same movie in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, the transaction systems will say, you don't need that, we'll do all that. They'll do 65% of it, maybe 70, and they will make it very difficult um, such that 65% is good enough provider because the extra 35%, we're not always going to cooperate on integration. So that's the fight, and that's the wrestling match. But ultimately, the data is owned by the patient, not Humedica, not Explorus. It's not even owned by the provider. The provider has rights to it because they're treating that patient. And the provider has to have the ability to do what it wishes with that data in order to take care of those patients. And we as vendors cannot create artificial walls. So, so Chris, uh, is the industry, I mean, I think the common uh, wisdom would be that, um, that as all this transformation is happening, uh, that the loser in the industry will be, will be the health plans. And, and maybe the most obvious winner will be the providers. And so maybe talk about that a little bit and perhaps even feel free to comment about, about Valence Health, a company uh, investment of, of mine, whose board you chair. Yeah, I, we have one single um, operating goal, and that's to help providers become payers, fundamentally. So that's the, both the uh, disclaimer and the, and the advertisement. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, it's over for the payers. I, the problem is I just don't know when to short uh, United. Uh, you know, it, it, it would be, uh, there will be a lot of, of um, a lot of changes in assets values uh, as we move as we move to risk and as providers um, uh, are successful at risk. I mean, the, when you think about <clears throat> the, the what insurance companies have to face uh, beginning January 1st when they face MLR limits, <clears throat> uh, they're, they're preparing for it by becoming more information companies. But uh, you know, our view is that the providers are going to be able to uh, dispense with the intermediary uh, activity of information provided by insurers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take a little while. The insurers have the capital, uh, just like hospitals have the capital right now. But you know, one uh, loose association I had a conversation last night with the CEO of a provider group. It's got about 1,200 primary care physicians, ambulatory primary care physicians. Um, you know, if that all moved to risk, um, you're talking about 2.4 million patients and about 20 billion of cash flow. Um, and I think that, that now it hasn't all moved to risk, but the context was, you know, why do you need to negotiate contracts with payers when you potentially are at the front end of, of that kind of cash flow? You'll be able to attract capital from other places, but from, not from insurers and not from hospitals. So it is, it is a ma in my view, a massive uh, opportunity from an investment standpoint. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be better care for, I mean, at the end of the day, I care, I really would like to see on my tombstone that you know, patient care improved. And I think as we remove the complexity of the third party system, uh, it's going to be better for patients. So it's going to happen. And, my humble view. So I, I want people to start thinking about questions for, for our group. I've got a couple more, so, uh, so please, please let me know. Queue up, grab a microphone, uh, or just uh, shout out in a loud fashion. But Jean, you've done a lot of consulting work for, for the plans, and they're not going to sit idly by. Some of them will make some great strategic acquisitions, perhaps like our friend at the end of the table. Uh, but so are they, are they the most obvious acquirers of big data-focused companies, do you think? Or, or will they kind of sit idly by and wait for the next few innings to, to evolve? So the functions that they provide will be required, whether the ultimate uh, owner, if you will, is a um, provider or a, a payer. 
And so, uh, and, and I think also the thing to remember is there's an enormous amount of diversity within the payer space right now. So some that focus on Medicaid, others that focus on, you know, individual market, others on group. So it, um, it does appear that the trend is towards uh, disruptors, as you were saying, that um, are becoming more integrated. Uh, but that, that trend will, will take a while to, you know, make wend its way. Um, what I think we'll, you're, you're going to find on the payer side is they're going to focus on using data because that's the pressure they face right now to lower their cost uh, and to try to simplify uh, their business. Uh, I think where we're going to really see the ROI from the data, though, is on the consumer side and the patient journeys and very simple targeted granular applications. So if you think about how you can uh, rent a car these days, um, if you go to Hertz, they'll send you a confirmation now and they'll say, if you don't like the car, you can change it and not have to wait in that line for a half hour to you know, ask for a new car. So, uh, and it's those kinds of things that I think will fundamentally change the way we think about the experience of uh, being a patient. So that's where I think we'll see the ROI. So what's the role of a company like Google uh, when it comes to healthcare, big data. I mean, they're, they're a tremendous innovator. Uh, they, they certainly have the capital uh, to go after the space. Uh, we all know uh, that they're targeting it in a big way, again, with what will be a multi-billion dollar investment behind it. And so, so how do you view your interactions, maybe Steve and Mike for you, uh, and Chris for you too, with regard to Valence Health, but how do you view your a potential partnering relationship with, with Google where do you see them intersecting in healthcare big data? I think there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of runway there on that. And they were in and backed out before um, the whole PHR um, investment and strategy uh, you know, didn't pan out. The consumer behavior didn't, uh, didn't evolve the way that either one of those companies, Microsoft or Google, uh, anticipated. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, the data in healthcare is very, very sensitive. Um, so as much as Google might invest in the space, I think there's going to be some natural or environmental issues that are, that are, going, to be, uh, that are going to be liabilities that are out there for their, uh, that, that model. I think from a processing and technology standpoint, you know, great potential. We, we really built on the same kinds of fundamental architectures that run under Google. So that's, we align with that very closely. <clears throat> It'll be interesting. I, you know, I think it's still pretty early with their, mm -hmm. their initial uh, re-entrant. Mike, one other question for you before we turn it over to some people that are queued up in the halls here. What's the role of non-healthcare data? So there's a local Boston area company called Predalytics uh, that's really, uh, I think, very creatively um, uh, meshing in a lot of non-healthcare data together with healthcare data to yield some you know, pretty novel insights. How do you think about the role of non-healthcare data? Yeah, I think it's back to your question on retail. <clears throat> um, you know, in retail, the retail industry knows a lot about you and uses that inf information to influence your behavior, influence your action. And so in a manner that's totally you know, HIPAA compliant and so forth, that's happening today. There's information that um, is not necessarily um, clinical information information on your educational status. Well, your educational status impacts your adherence to medication. It impacts how you are willing to accept and receive communication from the institution or the provider or the insurer. And different cohorts of individuals respond differently to text depending on mobility versus phone calls, versus voicemails, versus letters. And so as you create hyper-segmentation of the consuming public, because the patient is the retail consumer here, um, you can use that behavioral information and that other descriptive information. There is behavioral consumption pattern information available today, not by individual necessarily, but using um, cohort matching and probabilistic statistical analysis. You can create with high degrees of confidence an understanding that certain cohorts of individuals will behave certain ways We'll go to the ER instead of the doctor. We'll take their meds or we'll not. And with roughly 40% of the population having at least one chronic disease, it's a lot of individuals consuming a lot of, a 
lot of drugs and incurring a lot of health care costs, and they're the healthy sick as opposed to the really sick. And so um, I think there are ways of using consumption pattern data, behavioral da data, and mashing that with specific big data at the clinical and financial level and actually impacting what you do to push that information into the workflow and it's the mind's eye of the physician and the consumer. And we're Great. doing it today. Great. We've got some questions in the audience, so fire away. Thanks very much. It's uh, Seamus Donnelly from University College Dublin. I'm an academic working in the connected health uh, area and also a practicing clinician. And at this session and this morning's session, a phrase has been tossed out there about sharing risk, taking the risk. And you asked Bill about can we learn from other allied disciplines and businesses. And I just want to remind you about the Craig Vetner and the great scientific discovery of the human genome and the promise that was sold and probably oversold at that time to various patient groups, cystic fibrosis and others, that you'd have a cure within a short period of time. And shortcuts were taken and then accidents happened and St. Jude's and other hospitals. And it set back that industry, that academic years. <clears throat> and taking risk and absorbing risk and sharing risk, are we ready for that? All it takes is one uh, small SME, bad apple, and a class action suit, and it could set back this industry generations. And what do we mean by taking the risk? And what precautions do we have for something like that? Mm -hmm. Chris, why don't you take that? Uh, that's a very nicely articulated uh, question, but it ignores the reality that there are finite, finite resources. Um, and I think 10 years ago, when the economies were clipping along, uh, the Irish economy was really clipping along, uh, <laughs> there was a, uh, it was possible to ignore the reality of, of those constraints. Um, we're in a no-growth world now. Um, I, there, I mean, all the economists have come around from 5% you know, projection for growth to, well, we think it'll be 25 and we're sorry we were wrong. It was one and, one and a quarter. Uh, and, and I think that underlying reality, whether it's the U.S. economy or the EU, China's slowing down, uh, it, it makes, it, it requires us to manage the financial risk. Um, so I don't think that there is a, a, a potential catastrophe that could, could slow this down for, for, for decades. I mean, I think that there will be bumps in the road, but I, I've said it, I'll just say it again, I think unequivocally the, the risk will move to the, the financial risk will join the clinical risk that providers uh, have to take in order to control costs and generate better, and I genuinely believe much, much better outcomes because of all the waste that exists in a fragmented fee-for-service world. So can I just add to that? So, so if you have a national contract with a national provider to do cardiology or monitor in the community uh, cardiac events and patient well-being, and something goes wrong, you're saying the health provider and not you, the company, is liable? No, no, I, it has nothing to do with liability. Um, it has, I don't believe it has anything to do with malpractice risk, and I think it's all healthcare is local. So that we're, we're and in the UK, we're certainly seeing that as the uh, as the government moves to uh, uh, commissioning groups on on the 200,000 population level, uh, and those groups are all GPs, you know, collections of GPs. So I think it's all going to stay local, and the the malpractice issues is, are, are going to. I, I believe, have an inevitable uh, course to uh, r reduction, of, uh, reduction of that risk with caps and so on. Okay. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Seamus. Next question. Good morning. Jurgen Kleng from Booz uh, Health Analytics Group. Um, I have a, I wanted to talk We should, we should have you up on our panel, I guess. Fair enough. <laughs> Maybe next time. Um, so I had a question more around uh, the topic around democratization of data. And I mean, as the internet and Google and others have taught us, uh, it, there is really an empowerment of the public also. And if you put that on our topic here, it would be uh, empowerment of the patient. And so the patients are becoming smarter as they have access to more data. So if you take that into account, um, you know, uh, 
oftentimes we also are well aware of all the issues around quality of care, you know, um, medication errors, uh, suboptimal treatments, and so forth. So more knowledge is floating around about that topic, and uh, is that also perhaps starting to pose some kind of a risk or new exposure to the uh, uh, provider world when, um, you know, information that otherwise was perhaps not known before, now it's all in the data and they should have known and they should have been able to act differently than, than, than perhaps they did. So it may be a new kind of exposure or threat even that comes from that. Is anybody seeing, are you seeing that in any of your work? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and if we roll forward, um, so a couple of thoughts. One is, I'm not sure we're ever going to balance the tension between supply and demand uh, in healthcare unless the individual is far more involved. Uh, the second thing is there is ultimately no better team captain than either the patient or somebody who really cares very deeply about the patient. So empowering family members, for example, through this kind of thing will be very, very important. And I think it links back to the talk this morning on patient reported outcomes and that sort of thing, which is the richer information we get about that sort of information and put that into the, the holistic data set that we have, the more we can pick up chronic disease uh, exacerbation before it gets really uh, as bad as it needs to, uh, the more you can pick up that someone may need to go and get an intervention before they get sick, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and that for me is a part of the promise of big data. Coming back to the question you had asked earlier, I think EHR is table stakes. Uh, you know, we, we need to have it. It's like putting in transmission lines. Uh, but the real question is, how do you then generate the value from that? So. Thank you for the Thank question. Uh, next question, please. Yeah, you guys will get tired of me. Um, I'm a physician and a relatively newly minted CEO, so I sort of understand both sides of the picture a little bit now. And I'm going to speak uh, at a high level. I'm probably going to oversimplify a few things. Uh, but I remember I looked at managed care as potentially a, a tool that would have dramatically improved outcomes and provided tremendous cost savings. But the idea of for-profit managed care was sort of absurd because what it meant was that uh, all those health care savings were almost by definition going to have to go to uh, shareholders and to bonuses and that it wasn't really going to get back to the patient and that in some respects what was an extraordinary tool was wasted. And I'm looking at big data the same way. You know, big data is potentially an extraordinary tool for improved patient outcomes and cost savings. And what I'm beginning to see is that the, the people that are lining up to take the, the value out of big data, because everybody knows the informatics is extraordinarily valuable, are not the clinicians, are not the research interests. I see the for-profit interests lining up on big data and everybody taking their piece. And you know, maybe you can comment on that. I have the sense that the same thing's gonna play out with big data as it did with managed care. Yeah, <laughs> Mike, I go mean, ahead. And I'd have a comment that you know, our purpose as a company is to unlock the power of big data and improve healthcare for everyone. And one of the fundamental tenets is to support research. And so it doesn't pay any bills at all, <laughs> it's for sure. And the, you know, we've got so many examples of uh, research institutions that have been able to leverage the aggregated data that we've put together. I know, I know Michael does too, that have, have had tremendous impact, lowering costs on research, ability to really uh, uh, understand uh, effective care paths better, things that just, they don't drive any real ROI. So I don't know who's lining up around it. Maybe you're thinking some of the bigger technology companies, but um, I, that's not our visibility. We don't, we wouldn't have that perspective. I'm not pointing any individual. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just yeah. looking I haven't in seen general. Anybody. Yeah. Let, me add, let me add. I haven't seen anybody Let me add that. to that. So I agree with you on managed care, but who here thinks we were really managing care? It was an attempt at managing cost. The gentleman behind you thinks we were trying to, so it was managed cost and we know how that went. So in the era of managed care, there was every industry other than a couple, I would argue education is similar to healthcare. We don't have a good handle on the inputs and the outputs of that manufacturing process. It might even be behind healthcare. Um, but what industry doesn't have a good, complete, solid, longitudinal, full continuum view of its manufacturing process. And so managed care in the absence of that view clinically 
because without the clinical physician view, we're wasting our time. So our customers who are successful are physician-led. There was no CMIO 10 years ago, except in rare cases. And so the organizations look back to the point on risk. We're not um, doing anything other than managing risk differently. When you have 1,000 physicians all doing their own thing without information on how their colleagues who they respect might be achieving better outcomes, that's just you know, a different kind of risk. All we're doing now is we're not asking the machine to take over. We're saying, let's understand optimal clinical pathways, cl optimal care patterns that are most efficient and effective and appropriate for that cohort. Let's pull that information together both inter and intra, both within your organization. You have tremendous variation within your organization. And by the way, you might learn from colleagues in other parts of the country. And let's provide knowledge, because knowledge is power, and those organizations where the CMIO and the CMO drive the process that we implement are the ones that have the credibility and the respect of their physician community. And all we're doing is centralizing and harnessing the knowledge. They still have to. Every decision is physician and patient specific. But if we can give them that information and get out of the way, I think you're in a situation where you can actually manage better because you have information to drive out variation. Chris, do you have a quick comment before the next question? Uh, yeah, first, there's, a, I think, an enormous difference in the environment uh, today compared to 20 years ago when managed care failed um, and spawned uh, a totally out of control uh, PPO environment. Uh, <clears throat> we now have uh, the removal of antitrust uh, from the FTC in 2004, which allows hospitals and physicians to integrate. That's enormous. We, we now have real data to drive strategy and operations. It didn't exist then. Capitation deals were done on the back of a napkin with a, with a, with a hope and a, and a, and a prayer. Uh, and as I said earlier, that was a high growth era uh, for, the, for the country. It was, there was a lot of, uh, there, there were fewer constraints. Uh, so that's very, very different. Now, uh, to the for-profit question, I'd just comment that you know, it, it's really an issue of whether you're talking about net income, meaning not for profit is you know, kind of not for taxes, um, versus for profit. Any way you look at it, there's the, I mean, what do we have, 1,500 people in this audience at, you know, let's say $100,000 a year, everybody's in healthcare. You know, that's $150 million of, of, uh, of income that's going to members of this room. So it, it's about rationalizing where that, where that money goes. Um, and and I, I, I believe the capital is going to have to come from companies willing to take risk and invest in, invest in products. So yeah, there should be some return to shareholders, but that's just going to be a transfer of net income from, from not-for-profit insurance companies like the Blue Crosses of the world. I apologize in advance to whoever I'm offended at. There's probably 30 people from Blue Cross here. But, but it's a transfer of that net income to for-profit. That's okay with me. We have time for one more, one more question. All right, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Alex Lowenthal, Kaiser Permanente. I think we are managing care, as evidenced by our quality outcome. But that's not my question. Um, Bill asked a question earlier about your thoughts on the uh, future of EMRs, EHRs. I guess I'm just curious what you guys think of entities like Practice Fusion that are pushing to the market free EHRs uh, recognizing the value proposition of data accumulation. I guess I'm just wondering if you think it's brilliance or folly on their part. And, and I, let me layer on top of that question as well. So do you think the business model of a billion five for a major health system and a five-year implementation is sustainable for either party, either the EMR or the health system? So I'll, I'll layer on top of his practice fusion, fusion question. Who wants to take that one? This model's got a long way to go, I think. The, um, you know, in our experience in banking and telecom, the ERP type systems came in again, back to that point, they thought they would deliver everything. Um, I think uh, living on a secondary use of data model as a pure revenue stream is really challenging uh, for, for any group because I don't believe that, uh, number one, data is going to be more democratized, so it's going to be challenging to monetize that data. But um, 
I, I do think there'll be, you know, we call it, you know, we're in the middle of healthcare hunger games here, so, you know, that's all there is to it. Yeah, and, you know, with this, you're going to see not only the consolidation of the large healthcare systems, possibly down to when the dust settles in mega, 50 mega or something of that nature, you're going to see the same thing around these. Uh, EMR vendors that uh, may be able to transition towards ERP-like substances that we've seen in banking and telecom. Uh, but again, I, you know, I think that uh, there's going to be lots of shots on goal with yeah. different models before we see what, what, what really sticks. Just, just to make sure we answer <clears throat> the question on practice fusion and on Kaiser as well, the reason Kaiser is managing care is because it's an integrated delivery network that has a full view into its entire manufacturing process decades before most of Provider America. Now, as we move from 5,000 to 4,000 to 3,000 to 2,000 to maybe under 1,000 large integrated systems over the next decade or two, unless all of those toss out every technology they have as they've consolidated and buy Epic, unless that's what they do, then they don't have the benefit that, of what Kaiser had, which was starting from the ground floor and weaving it together the way they did. So I, I agree 100%. Kaiser is a phenomenal model. The question is, how do you get there with a different circumstance? With Practice Fusion, since I don't want to uh, talk about a specific company whose CEO I know, um, I'll talk more broadly about the fact that on the inpatient side of medicine, there were once hundreds of EMRs, and then there were 10, and then there were five, and now there's two significant ones, maybe three. The same consolidation will occur on the ambulatory side where there are hundreds, but it will move to a few. And the reality is that a lot of EMRs are being provided either for free or to very small physician practices, not the large ones. And as those small physician practices get consolidated, which they will, those EMRs will not necessarily remain in place. So there are some challenges there. John, I know you're dying to make a, a quick comment, but 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, Technology is really going to help here because the key to the EMR actually is the data that you collect, and it's now far easier to take unstructured data sets and make something of them. Um, Cerner is already saying that they believe the EMR will get commoditized within the next five to ten years and they're actively uh, moving on with a strategy of uh, having an open platform where uh, application developers can come and build apps. So you have the classic Microsoft versus um, you know Apple type of debate occurring uh, in the industry and it's open question as to where it will go. Now you could say well look Cerner had no choice um, but it will be very interesting to see where this goes. My sense is that uh, 10 years from now, we're going to be in a place where a uh, Java-like type um, alternative will uh, emerge because the money just isn't there in the industry to fund successive waves because that's what it will take, um, successive waves of these kinds of implementations. Great. Thank you for letting us be with you today, and thank you to our panelists. Really appreciate your time.